Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really excited to talk about narcolepsy as an autoimmune disorder and whether it should be treated as such. Um, I do have some disclosures, but they're not very relevant to the current talk. So narcolepsy, as you already know, is a relatively rare disorder. Its cause is unknown. There's a genetic component, which is important in immune regulation. And this has led to the hypothesis that interference with the immune system may be helpful in patients. We know that antibodies can be biomarkers for specific neuronal pathology and in some instances relate to an immunotherapy responsive disease. So is this the case in narcolepsy? Well, I'm afraid that I think the evidence is insufficient and somewhat conflicting. So narcolepsy, as we've already described, is an acquired presumed autoimmune condition. It's associated with complete and selective loss of the hypocretin cells from the lateral hypothalamus. As a result, the CSF levels of hypocretin are very low or negative. Why might it be considered autoimmune? Well, because of the association with the HLA locus, the association with the T-cell receptor alpha locus, note T-cell receptor, not B-cell, triggering roles of infections, streptococcus, influenza, H1N1, and vaccinations. And of course, there are anecdotal responses, uh, anecdotes of responses to immunotherapies. Here is a diagram, a, a picture, which, which nicely shows um, some of the potential treatments of these putative um, disease. Uh, in this case, you could either have antibodies, which are shown here, or you could also have T cells. And really, T cells against hypocretin, the very specifically expressed neuropeptide, could explain best the specific loss of hypocretin neurons. Antibodies would also need to be specific to those neurons if they were to cause this very specific disease. Now, antibodies are much easier to look for than T cells. And we know that there are two main sorts of antibodies, those directed against intracellular androgens, mainly paraneoplastic like anti-HU, anti-YO, and those patients are generally speaking immunotherapy unresponsive. This kind of condition is thought to be caused by cytotoxic T cells. There are some antibodies that are biomarkers for a process that is pathological, but may not be the pathogenic agent like GAD and GFAP antibodies, but antibodies directed against cell surface extracellular antigens are not necessarily cancer associated and the patients are immunotherapy responsive, as I'm sure you know. So are there any antibody mediated sleep disorders? Well, definitely. There is Morven syndrome, which is defined by insomnia and associated with Casper 2 LGI1 antibodies and very good response to immunotherapy. There's limbic encephalitis associated with LGI1 or Casper 2 antibodies, and those patients have a range of sleep disorders and very good responses. The NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis is associated with varying degrees of insomnia, hypersomnia, or sleep arousals, as recently described by the Barcelona group, and very good responses to immunotherapies. And there are others, IG long 5 antibody disease, not always perfect responses, but definitely some response to immunotherapies. So why not narcolepsy? Well, cell surface neuronal antibodies are the best biomarker for an immunotherapy responsive disease. So let's start with pandemics associated narcolepsy. During the H1N1 epidemic in 2009, most H1N1 influenza vaccines were done with a mild form of vaccine. The Pandemrix vaccine was known to be more effective at raising antibodies specific to the H1N1. And it was used particularly in the UK and Scandinavia and other countries in Northern Europe. What was fascinating is that the incidence of narcolepsy rose, particularly in children. And as an aside, we were doing the hypocretin assays at the time, and we noticed this. There are far more children being diagnosed as narcoleptic. So the first question was, was there any evidence of raised general immunity in healthy children 
after the pandemic's vaccination. And we were lucky enough to work with Professor Andrew Pollard, who um, had done the vaccination trial on controls um, before the uh, pandemic was actually released. And so these were healthy children before and after the pandemic's trial vaccine. And you can see that the IgG levels really didn't change to any significant extent. And also there was no real appearance of any of the antibodies that we tested with NMDA receptor and CASPA2 antibodies um, shown here. So there was no increase in total serum IgG or in NMDA or CASPA2 antibodies that was significant in 44 healthy children after pandemics. So next thing, of course, was to try and treat, uh, to test the patients themselves. And we were lucky enough to get some from the Scandinavian colleagues um, who were collaborators on this study. And we studied serum and CSF from 13 patients with post H1N1 narcolepsy. They were all children. Some serum bound to the hypocretin expressing hypothalamic neurons. Oh, exciting. No, because those serum also bound, the antibodies in them, also bound to many other neurons. And you can see that here. It's not just the erexin neurons, which are in red. It's lots of neurons. In fact, most of them. Also, all the cerebral spinal fluids were completely negative for binding on any kind of tissue um, section as shown here. So we found no evidence of a specific antibody. So that's slightly surprising, perhaps, because our editor reported the presence of antibodies to the hypocretin receptor, not the hypocretin itself, um, in post pandemic narcolepsy samples. Could these be pathogenic? Well, actually, seems unlikely because they, the receptor is not expressed only on the hypocretin cells. In fact, it's expressed very widely throughout the brain. So you might expect a much less specific disease if you had those antibodies. So it didn't really explain anything. And in fact, a more recent study um, suggested that they could not find antibodies to hypocretin receptor 2 or several other proposed antigens in any of the pandemics associated narcolepsy patients that they examined. But what about those without the pandemics? Could there be some antibodies to hypocretin receptor 2 in non pandemics narcolepsy sera? And we were able to work with um, Gian, uh, Maria Pia Giannacaro and her colleagues from Bologna. Um, she came to Oxford to work with me for three years. And one of the first things we did was to look for antibodies against a hypocretin receptor 2 in narcolepsy, conventional, ordinary narcolepsy, not pandemics related. And we studied um, 59 sera of various kinds, but most of them were NT or narcolepsy type 1, which is um, the main type of um, autoimmune-related narcolepsy. And we found only three positives, two in narcolepsy type 1 and one in narcolepsy type 2, which doesn't have the typical cataplexy. And the titers were not very high. And to be honest, it wasn't a very convincing study, other than to say that these antibodies are not present in any number of patients with narcolepsy. However, a more interesting observation was that also made by the Bologna group with collaborators from both California and, and um, London. Uh, and this was that there were complex movement disorders at disease onset in childhood narcolepsy with cataplexy. So this was uh, published in Brain in 2011 with videos, and we're not allowed to show videos, otherwise I would be showing you one. And what they said was, we found that patients with narcolepsy with cataplexy, so the full NT1, displayed a complex array of negative hypotonia and active movement disorders. And these active movement disorders range from perioral movement to dyskinetic dystonic movements or stereotypies. Now that sounds frightfully familiar, doesn't it? because many known antibodies are associated with movement disorders, particularly the NMDA receptor and LGI-1 antibodies, which are associated with a particular dystonic form of epilepsy. 
So perhaps these childhood onset patients do have antibodies to neuronal antigens. So we studied 59 sera from patients with narcolepsy type 1, and we looked particularly for known antibodies to the NMDA and GABA A receptors, to LGI1, CASPA2, and to hypercretin receptor 2. And in fact, eight sera were positive, which is a little bit more encouraging. What was interesting was that 22 children were children, and four of those had NMDA receptor antibodies, one had LGI1 antibodies, and one had hypercretin receptor 2 antibodies. Now, to have six out of 22 with a positive antibody is beginning to look interesting. There were two additional patients with the hypercretin receptor antibodies. Um, they had actually had childhood onset, but they were adults at the time. So here's the eight patients altogether that we found antibodies from, and I'm not going to go um, through this in any detail, of course, but it was interesting because of the relatively recent onset of disease at the time of serum sampling, and many of them had had a very acute onset with cat cataplexy coming very soon after the sleep disorder, which, of course, is not common in all patients. So it was like an acute form of narcolepsy. And if you got the serum early enough, you might find an antibody, particularly in these children. So it was quite encouraging. What was more interesting was that active movements of the type that had been described previously were present in 63% of children and 30% of the adults and they were more common and of greater severity in the children. Antibodies to NMDA, hypercretin, or LGI-1 were found overall in eight patients with active movements and in none of the patients without active movements or in the controls studied in parallel. The presence of specific neuronal antibodies and active motor phenomena in these cases, four of whom had atypical narcolepsy, suggests that they might perhaps have a different etiology and benefit from immunotherapy early in the course of the disease. And that's about where it stands as far as uh, we're concerned, because their narcolepsy was in at least half of the cases with antibodies atypical. So the HLA was not typical, or they had normal levels of hypercretin. And that suggests that they have a slightly different form of disease, and perhaps that might be responsive to immunotherapy. What else would explain the apparent autoimmunity and very specific loss of the hypercretin neurons? Well, of course, as I showed you at the beginning, it could be the hypercretin receptor specific, sorry, hypercretin specific T cells, because when cells present antigens to their surface, those antigens come from the inside, which is, of course, where hypercretin is stored. So a cell that was expressing antigen surface on the surface would be expressing antigens that were from inside the cell. And that would explain, if it was a T cell recognition, it would explain how those cells were specifically deleted by the immune response. Now, there've been a number of studies, very um, nice studies, showing that there are some T cells that seem to be hypercretin specific in patients and in a number of different situations, animal models, etc. And I've only mentioned two of the publications here. But these individuals with narcolepsy suffer from abnormal sleep patterns due to loss of neurons that uniquely supply, supply hypercretin. Here we present evidence of in vivo expansion of DQ6, that's the relevant HLA, hypercretin tetrama binding T cells in DQ6 individuals, both with and without narcolepsy, our analysis of in vivo expansion of hypercretin cells opens an avenue for further investigation of the autoimmune contribution to narcolepsy development. Well, it does, but to be honest, there were only two patients with narcolepsy who were tested. The T cells were a little bit unusual, it's not at all clear yet how relevant this is going to be, but certainly I think it's in the right direction. 
So maybe the T cells are what really matter. And if you're going to try and prevent the disease, you would want to block their entry into the brain. And obviously, naturalizumab, for instance, would be a very obvious drug to try. And perhaps my colleague, Professor Losey, has already mentioned that. Um, maybe he's using it. I don't know, because unfortunately, we have to record these debates independent of the other speaker. But if this was the case, that you could stop those T cells going in, you would have to recognize the presence of those T cells very early in the disease. Because the trouble is that by the time the patients present and are diagnosed, they appear to have lost all their hypocretin production already, and they probably lost all those cells already. And there's no reason to believe they're going to suddenly redevelop them. So in summary, positive antibodies of any kind were rare in narcolepsy type 1. None that we could detect were specific for hypocretin neurons. The narcolepsy in those that did have antibodies is often atypical regarding HLA or CSF hypocretin levels. The usefulness of these markers for the establishment of an immune therapy needs to be assessed much more carefully. And a specific T cell mediated disease is more likely, in my view, but unfortunately, it's much more difficult to identify early enough to prevent the hypocretin cell loss. So in summary and conclusion, it is not yet appropriate to use immunotherapies in narcolepsy type 1. Thank you for listening.